On today's episode of the Dad Tired Podcast, I present a challenge that I think will give you and your family an opportunity to see a side of God that you may be missing. I also sit down with Emmy Award winning news anchor Greg Bledsoe to hear why he gave up his successful career to follow a dream that God had put inside of him. Before we get into that, though, I want to thank my friends over at Hia Health for making today's episode possible. I know some of you dads listening may not be giving too much thought about the vitamins that your kids are taking, or maybe you just leave it up to your wife to make those decisions, but I want to challenge you to give this some thought. Hia Health was actually started by two dads who realized the vitamins they were giving their kids were essentially sugar-filled candy in disguise, so they decided to do something about it. Did you know that 93% of kids don't eat enough fruits and vegetables? And we all know that what kids eat instead are chicken fingers, mac and cheese, processed foods, ice cream, and more. And the vitamins that are supposed to fill in those nutritional gaps are based on out-of-date nutritional guidelines from the 1980s. Haya fills in the most common gaps in modern children's diets to provide the full-body nourishment our kids need with a yummy taste they love. My kids absolutely love these vitamins. They're made from 12 farm-fresh fruits and vegetables and supercharged with 15 essential vitamins and minerals known to help support a healthy immune system, energy levels, brain function, mood, teeth, bones, and more. Most children's vitamins are filled with 5 grams of sugar and can cause a variety of health issues. Haya is made with zero sugar and zero gummy junk, yet it tastes great and is perfect for picky eaters. It's non-GMO, vegan, dairy-free, allergy-free, gelatin-free, nut-free, and everything else you can imagine. It's manufactured here in the United States with globally sourced ingredients, each selected for optimal bioavailability and absorption. We've worked out an exclusive offer with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Dad Tired listeners receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, you must go to HayaHealth.com forward slash Dad Tired. Or enter the code Dad Tired at checkout. That's H I Y A H E A L T H dot com slash Dad Tired. Hiya Health dot com slash Dad Tired and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. Again, go to HiaHealth dot com forward slash Dad Tired or enter the promo code Dad Tired at checkout. Greg, so excited to have you hanging out with us today, man. For the audience who may not be familiar with you, tell us who you are, what you're up to these days. Yeah. So my name is Greg Bledsoe. I've spent the last 20-ish years in San Diego. Wife, two kids, two years old, six years old. So we're in the thick of it. But right now, we're actually out on the road. We live in our car and (laughs) we're just trying to see as much as we can and teach our kids as much as we can over the next... uh, The plan's to do it for about a year. We'll see what happens. Um, Hmm. But uh, we're loving it. It was a, a long road to get here. And now we're... Every day's an adventure. Yeah, man. Well, some guys who are watching if they were watching on YouTube, if we post this on YouTube, I don't know if we will, because I just woke up like 30 minutes ago and I look like, <laughs> I, like I live out of a car, <laughs> but, but uh, that was, <laughs> I didn't mean for that to sound offensive. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. If they're watching, they may recognize your face. If they're listening and they have lived in San Diego area at all in the last several years, they may recognize your voice because you had a career in news. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So tell us a little bit about that. So yeah, I've spent my entire career from out of college until uh, a few months ago with NBC News in San Diego and started out right out of college. I was writing, I was running the teleprompter, just happy to have a job and, and, and put uh, what I put used to uh, learn in college to good use. And then I spent 19 years there kind of working my way up through the ranks and ended up anchoring the weekday morning show for about the last five years. So if you woke up dark and early in the morning. That's where you would have seen me. We were, we were on from 4.30 to 7 every day. So it was an early curtain call. I've done a couple interviews on those morning shows or, and I've watched a few and I just like that. I can't imagine having to get up early every day for work. Like, what time were you getting up? I'd get up around 2 or 2.30 oh my every gosh. day. This was in the, the chapter where we had two little kids, you know, our, our yeah. second was born right in the middle of that. So, uh, I mean, I know you're a dad and a, and a lot of dads listening. So, I mean, it was a grind to be up that early every morning, but people in that business do it. And I have colleagues who thrive and just do great and love it. Hmm. Uh, my body's geared a little differently and it was a struggle for me. And I felt like I was, I wasn't disciplined. And when I would go to bed and I was just short on sleep all the time, and then that affects your psyche. And I just, you know, it, it just over some time, it, brought me down a little bit. I just, I felt like I was, I was always tired and, and I wasn't as positive as I, as I was before. And I liked my job. I loved the people I worked with, but I was just tired all mm. the time. 
Mm. Dad tired on a whole. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. This isn't really an angle I necessarily want us to spend a bunch of time in, but I do want to hit it because we are in 2021. And so we have a thing called the family leadership program in the family leadership program. We invite guys in, they come in. It's, it's kind of like this more intense training where guys are stepping up to be the husbands, fathers, disciples that God's calling them to be. So they go through a lot of exercises that help them in that area. Mm-hmm. One of the exercises that I have them go through is basically to list out all the things that they feel like are contributing that are influencing their thinking on a daily basis. So this might be social media, maybe they're watching news, maybe the kind of music they're listening to. But a lot of times news does get brought up. Like a lot of guys will say, I'm watching probably too much news and it's affecting my overall thinking and it's affecting the way I view people or think of people or treat people or talk to people in real life. So we don't have to spend a bunch of time here, but from a guy who spent a lot of time in the news world, Do you have any thoughts on that or like advice for guys who may be consumed with news, which I'll be honest, I'll probably lump myself in that category. I actually could geek out on news and watch news all day long. I I really love it. But I do notice just like these other guys, it does affect me. It affects the way I see the world and people around me. So any thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, for one, I, I didn't spend my entire career as a journalist without loving the craft and loving and being a news junkie myself and loving storytelling primarily. And so I loved it. I think it's an important service. I just think it's one of the most important things we have in this country. All of that said, you know, a lot of the news coverage, especially these days, I mean, there's a lot of negativity out there where this country is pretty divided right now. And that can wear on you if you're in it every day and you're surrounded by it. And so it did on me a little bit. When I was out telling stories, I'd love to try and tell positive stories. That was my way around it. And that was my way of kind of refueling my tank and, and kind of getting past anything negative that we had to talk about. But but that's part of it. You know, there's a lot of bad stuff happening in the world. And it was our job to talk about a lot of those things. And so I totally get it. And I was right in the thick of it. And there were times where that would bring me down a little bit. But like I said, my way around it was to try and find the good in stories and try and find people that I think had something positive to say. And so I think with with people out there right now, who are taking all of that in, it's important to know what's going on around you and your community and your country, but also make a concerted effort to go out and find the positive stories to go along with that and find out, you know, who's helping, who's doing something good in your community and your country. And hopefully that can kind of counterbalance the, yeah. the other stuff you're taking in and you're still informed and you still feel connected to the world around you. That's great advice, man. And I think you're right. Because there's the fine line between, I don't want to bury my head in the sand and just kind of be oblivious to what's happening in the world. There are some crazy things happening in the world that we should be aware of. But I'll just speak for myself. I can't speak for every guy here, but I've noticed in myself when I'm consumed with news, it really does affect the way that I view the world. It can affect my hope or my joy and how I view other people. You know, it's so funny. I was telling you before we hit record that I was up late last night. You know, I couldn't sleep. I was in bed at 8.30. I tried to go to bed early and I didn't end up going to sleep until about one. I came across this YouTube channel. This is just classic. You know, I came across this YouTube channel where this kid, I, he's got to be a college student. I'm sure people know who I'm talking about. I'm not really big in the YouTube world, but he's normally like a prankster. You know, he just goes around, does pranks in public yeah. or whatever. But a lot of what he was doing was actually handing out cash. Like he would go around, pay people's rent super randomly, like knock awesome. on people's door and just be like, hey, I'm going to pay your rent today. And they're like, what? You know, they're so caught off guard. He'd go up to the bus station and say, I'm going to buy you a car today. <laughs> he's like a kid. I'm like, where are you getting? Where are you getting wow. that? Yeah, it was incredible stuff. So he's normally just kind of, he seems like this young, maybe college student, kind of famous YouTuber. I'm sure everyone knows who I'm talking about. I don't know who he is, but what was cool, two of us, but I, I love his yeah. story. So yeah. Yeah. It just reminded me, man, as I'm watching these stories of humanity, you know, and just like when people are putting away like the divisive issues and it's just like, You just see people tears. You saw people hugging each other. And it's just like, man, we're we're reminded that we're all just these broken humans trying to figure out our way in this world. And um, and for a lot of us, for those listening to the podcast, trying to figure out what does it look like to know Jesus and to love God and and how does that affect the way we live our family? I mean, just like the basic fundamental stuff of living a, a joyful, fulfilled life. So anyway, it was refreshing. I do want to talk about how you came from, I'm sure you'll have a hard time patting yourself on the back, but I'll pat you on the back. You had a very successful career. You had climbed the ladder and done really well in your industry and kind of made it to the top, what would be the top for a lot of people. And then you move from that and you started your introduction by saying, I'm living in a car with my kids now we're traveling the country. 
How did that change? What a drastic change, right? Yeah. And very intentional about it. And this wasn't a, a rash decision one night. We thought about this for 10 years before we actually pulled the trigger and did it. But yeah, I had a good career in TV and I will always love that. And, and I don't know what the future holds and where I'll be after this. But I think I came to a point where I wanted a change. And my wife and I had talked about 10 years ago, what if we just jumped in the car and drove around the, the country and told stories about the people we meet? And that's been sitting on my heart for a decade. Hmm. And over the last few years, you know, life happens. We, you know, bought a home, had kids, you know, the career was going great. And it's really easy to just get caught in that routine. For the most part, I was happy doing what I was doing, but there was always that, um, that pull to go and do this thing, to go tell people stories and to go see the country. And, and eventually we thought, you know, we don't want to put this off any longer. We have young kids. We think that this is a valuable experience for them. We think they're going to learn a lot. We're going to learn a lot. I hope other people learn a lot and are inspired by what we're doing. But it got to the point where we just said, okay, we don't want to wonder in 20 years why we didn't do this or what would have happened if we never did. And so I have no idea how this is going to turn out. I mean, we're right in the middle of this thing. Right? If we had done this interview in a year, I'd be able to tell you, oh yeah, this is a great experience or don't do that. Um, right, right. We're in the middle of this. I have no idea how this is going to turn out. I don't think we're ever going to regret it. And so I think in a year or 10 years, when we look back, I know it's going to be a, have been a good experience. I don't know if financially this is going to work out well. I don't know what this is going to do to my career when we come back, but I feel like right now in the moment, it is 100% the right decision and, and we just needed to find out. And I know there are a lot of people out there who have this thing pulling at them and I don't know if, if it's, they're afraid to do it or if it's scary or how long it's been there, but you know, we decided to just go for it and that's where we are right now and we're loving it. Again, I, I know you're, you're a humble guy and so you're going to have a hard time, you know, <laughs> speaking about all your accolades, but I mean, you won 24 Emmys for writing, shooting, editing. You were the National Press Photographer Association Solo Video Journalist of the Year two times in a row. I mean, like you have kind of an extreme story here, man, where you, you did really, really well. Not only that, but people were affirming you in your work. It's not like you were had a job that was a good job, but people were like, eh, I don't know if you're meant for this. Like everyone around you is kind of telling you, you're meant for this, man. You're doing a good job and this is your sweet spot. Maybe people who are listening, I imagine there's dads listening right now and their story might not be as extreme, right? Like they may not be kind of at the top of their career ladder and they want to go to, I'm going to get in a car and drive around the country with my family for the next year. Maybe their spectrum is smaller. Their limits are smaller on that spectrum, but maybe they do have something where it's like, I'm in a career, but I'm not happy. This isn't fulfilling me. This isn't giving me joy. I feel like it's taken away from my family. I'm not the dad I want to be. I'm not the husband I want to be. I'm not the man I want to be. But they don't know how to make that shift. Or maybe for a guy listening, they're like, how do I even know? Maybe I've got this thing in my heart, but I don't, I don't know. Am I, is it disobedient or irresponsible? Are people going to like say this is a, dude, it's a really foolish decision as trying to be the quote unquote leader of your family, provider of your family to make this kind of decision? How did you navigate? those questions as I'm sure they were coming up in your mind and around you. Yeah. They, they, I mean, they come up in my, my mind still now daily. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. as confident as I am that this is the right thing to do. I have moments every day where, where I think, what are we doing? <laughs> you know, and yeah. like, what happens when this is over? You know, we all have something that God has blessed us with a talent, a skill, a personality trait, something. It's not always directly related to what we do for a living, but Either way, there's something I feel like that we all have some sort of skill. And, and I think that we need to ask ourselves, what are we supposed to do with that? Hmm. Are we supposed to use that for ourselves and for our, our own, own advancement and for the betterment of our family, which is fine? Or is there, is there something that we can do to share that uh, with other people? And, and storytelling is what I've always wanted to do. It's what I've always loved doing, being behind the camera, editing, writing, talking to people. And I was lucky enough to be in a job for a long time where that was part of it. And I got to meet a lot of amazing people. And now my wife and I are asking ourselves, okay, what can we do with that? We want to share it. And I don't know if anyone will care or watch or listen, but we want to go and tell people stories because I feel like that's what we're good at. And hopefully it resonates with people and, and there'll be positive stories. But I think, you know, for dads out there who may be questioning, okay, what do I do with this thing that I have? I would say question one is, well, what is that thing you have? What can that thing you have do for other people? 
Mm. And in our case, I feel like even a, a simple, small story about an ordinary person who may have something positive to say, who may have something inspiring to say, if that can make someone else's day better or help someone in a decision in their life, then great, then we've done our job. All we are are middlemen this year between what I think are some really incredible people in this country and some people who probably need to hear what they say. And we just kind of want to bridge those two. Mm, That's a great way of saying that. You know what? Something I can relate to in your story that I think a lot of guys will relate to is, you know, I served in pastoral ministry in the church for 13 years. And I always used to tell my wife, I feel like I am an oval peg trying to be fit into a, or a circle hole. So it's close. And sometimes it even feels like it's going to fit. Yeah. And, and yet there's just something a little bit off. So it sounds like that's your story. Like, I'm, yeah. I, man, so much of this feels like it's my sweet spot. People are affirming me. I love lots of aspects of my job, but not all of it. Um, and there's, you know, there's certain things about every job that's just not great, you know, that comes with the territory, but you just know something in your guts, like there's just something off here. And I think some guys can relate to that where you might be doing something where you feel like I'm good at this. I even like most of it, but something's still off. I'm an oval peg in a circle hole. What would it look like? And there may be just a a minor pivot, a small pivot that would allow you to be in a sweet spot better if you explore that a little bit. And so one thing I'd love to hear from you is I've heard you talk about kind of reflecting back in order to hear what God's telling you today, you're going to reflect back on what God has been doing in your life in previous years. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, totally. So for us, when we made this decision to sort of walk away from a really comfortable situation, it was really tough. I mean, the toughest decision I've made in my entire life because I liked my job. I was tired, but I liked my job. I loved the people I worked with. I had fun most days at work. And so that's not easy to give up. But again, we felt this tug to do this thing. And so the, the question is, is like, okay, how do I know this is what we're supposed to do? Because I have no idea what lies ahead. So I think for us, the, the decision was made a lot of by looking back at what had happened over the last 20 years. A lot of doors had opened in my career fairly easily. I didn't have to move out of San Diego. I mean, it was a huge blessing in this business to be able to stay in one city and, and grow within one station. And I'm just so grateful to those people who made that happen. And so we would look back at having all of these doors opened, having things happen along the way that just made life easy. And and in my mind, that was God preparing us to do this. My skills, shooting video, editing, telling stories, stories coming, falling in, in my lap. Some people clearly hear God's voice. And they say, okay, I know exactly what I'm supposed to do. I can hear. And, and for me, our faith is a big part of our life. But I think sometimes I struggle with, with knowing, okay, what's God telling us to do? I, you know, I'm not, I'm not so sure, you know, and so this was a big decision for us for our future. So, so to make it, I think we just, we looked towards our past at what had happened, what sorts of doors had opened for us in the past, what sort of evidence was there in the past that things were working out, that my work as a storyteller had been growing for 18 years and and stories had fallen into my lap and people had come into my life that had made it easier and it taught me things. And and there were so many good things that happened over a long period of time without us having to put forward that much faith and never really take any chances that it was evidence to me that, okay, this is our turn now. Hmm. You know, God's done a lot for us over the last 20 years. That's evidence enough for me to take a leap of faith. I don't know what's ahead, but enough doors have opened over the last 20 years that I feel like one's going to open for us now. And so even without knowing what was going to happen, we felt confident doing this because I, I feel like something good will come of this. If, if only the experience with our family. I'm not expecting a million people to jump in and say, this is amazing. We, we want to be a part of this. But if it's only for our family and to, and to help us grow closer and to tell some good stories and inspire a few people, that's enough. Yeah. In summary, I think making a crazy decision about your future that you don't know anything about, it's easy to look back or or you should look back and see what's happened in your past. What doors has God opened in your past? And then trust that. Yeah. It's funny because I actually heard this on the news just this week, but I heard a news anchor talk about how we make so many life decisions based on our work and our career. So we make so many sacrifices for our work and for our career. And our families often sacrifice and us as men, we make big sacrifices. And he said, you know, what's so funny about that is like when you're on your deathbed, the HR 
you know, department isn't around you, you know, on your deathbed. They're, <laughs> they're not there. You, you've poured out your life for them that, and you've made sacrifices and your family has made sacrifices for you to do your work and to pour out your heart. And, you know, they're not there on your deathbed. And so basically what he was saying was focus on the people who are going to be around you on your deathbed, you know, like it's okay to give up maybe some standards. Maybe you have to reevaluate. Do we need this much money? Is there ways that we can sacrifice financially so that we can get back to the priorities that actually matter most? And I say that I've been in a similar situation more than once where Layla and I have sat down and we said, people were affirming our gifts in certain areas or maybe at a church or in a ministry and said, this is what you're built for. And yet something didn't feel right. And we've quit without knowing the next step. All we knew is we felt like God for sure is telling us that it's time to move on. And I have no idea what that means, but I will say I miss those seasons because the way that you rely on God, the way that your prayers change, the way that you, you pursue God, the way that you need God to show up for clarity, for finances, for all that is it's beautiful. And I think that's the way God designed it to be, you know, like, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow has enough worries of its own, but essentially be obedient today, focus on Jesus today and his kingdom today, and he'll take care of the rest. So I do want to talk about your kids are young. Yeah. So you're doing this right now. When I talked to you earlier, you're saying like, I don't even know if they'll remember like a lot of what we're doing, you know, like I'm trying to instill, I'm, I'm doing this for my family, but I don't even know how much they're going to remember. And so yeah. I know a lot of this for you is not just this next year, but you're trying to build some foundational stuff for years to come. Can you kind of unpack that a little bit? Yeah, we have a two-year-old and a six-year-old. The two-year-old probably won't remember a thing from this year. <laughs> the six-year-old's getting a lot out of it. I think yeah. he's learning a lot. He's having a great time. And so had we waited a few years Maybe it would have been more difficult, but maybe they would have gotten more out of it. Regardless, I think that this decision that we made now serves as an example as parents for the rest of us raising these kids. And what I mean is in 15 years, if they come to us and they're having a hard time making a, a life decision, we can say, well, we've been there. You know, we did that and we trusted God and we, and we took a leap of faith because it's what we felt like we were supposed to do. A lot of our decisions as parents may not necessarily pay off or be needed in the moment. Mm. But years later, you can look back and use your life as an example for how you want your kids to get through similar situations later on in their life. And I'm hoping that's what this is, that when my kids get older and they're at a crossroads, that they can come to us and we can give them some useful advice because we lived it, because we were there too. So while they may not get as much out of it now as they would when they're older, I still think that this is so valuable for them and also for us as parents, because it gives us a little bit more credibility, I hope later on. You know, a lot of the times we do as I say, not as I do. I mean, this is an example where hopefully in the future I can say, do as we did, or at least have faith that things are going to be okay if you take a chance. And the reason I know that as your dad is because we did it. And yeah. so I think that, I think that the, the parental advice that we can give in the future from this trip is really going to pay off while it may not pay off a lot right now in the moment. I mean, isn't that true for every area of our life, right? As a dad, we got to have skin in the game and all of it, whether it's decision-making or integrity stuff or character stuff. Like I don't want to be telling my kids to do stuff that I haven't practiced, put it into practice myself. So one of the things I, I would want a listener to right now pause and just ask yourself, for those of you who are listening, is is there something that right now, even as you're listening to this conversation, you're thinking, oh man, my heart is up a little bit because I think I might need to step into something that scares me and I've been avoiding it or I don't want to really go there or I'm nervous about it. And so I would just say, man, the fact that you're even listening to this conversation maybe God is drawing you or maybe he's stirring something in you that you need to address. And so I'll just leave it as vague as that because I God is big and he can do all kinds of things. I don't know if it's in regards to your job or a personal decision or a hard decision or what it is, but there may be something scary that God wants you to step into that you have been avoiding. And so maybe today is a day that God is trying to resurface that in your heart and make you revisit it. And so whatever that means for you, listener, as you are listening, man, I'll just trust the Lord and the Holy Spirit to kind of work out those details, but I'm going to encourage you to not avoid it. Greg, one of the things that I love about what you're doing is that you are going around telling people stories. I mean, it would be cool alone if you just packed up the car and drove around the country and you know had a cool hands-on homeschool experience kind of thing, you know, yeah. for kids. But 
you are doing that, but you're also purposely telling people stories, which I think is so cool. By the way, let's do a quick plug. You know, where can people watch all the way you're doing? Oh yeah. Yeah. Welcome. Jump on in. Family geography project is what we're calling this. It's we're on every social platform. Honestly, I I'm most comfortable and in, enjoy Instagram more than, yeah. than others. And so we're probably there more than other places. But yeah, wherever you are, if you just search family geography project, you'll find us. And we're hopefully going to tell dozens of these stories throughout the year. Yeah. So we'll link all those links so that people can easily click on that and go find you and follow along. You're an incredible storyteller and incredible videographer. At, I mean, it's like, I feel like I'm watching mini documentary, you know, watching your stuff. You're very, very, very good. But what I was getting with that is you're taking the time to tell ordinary people's stories. And as I heard that part of your story, I was thinking, when is the last time I, and probably a lot of listeners just sat down to hear somebody's story. Like we just don't do that anymore. Kind of going back to what I was talking about with the news thing, we we make all kinds of assumption about people based on the influences of the things that we're listening to. But when's the last time you just sat down and listened to somebody's story with no agenda? Can you give the listener who maybe hasn't done that in a long time or forever, how do you go about doing that? What are some tips when you're trying to, to hear some story and why is it so important to sit down and to hear somebody's story? Well, I think it's important for you as the storyteller and for also the person telling their story. I've interviewed enough people over the last two decades to know that I sometimes see how much it helps them to tell their story. And also a lot of people don't realize that they have a story to so tell. So true. So true. Until they start talking about it. And everybody you meet, everybody you meet every day has something interesting to tell you, something about their life that can either encourage you or that you can learn from or that can just entertain you. I'm mean, everybody you meet. And so I'm not worried at all that there will be a shortage of stories to tell yeah. this year. Everybody keeps asking me, where are you going to find your stories? Honestly, there've been a few along the way already that I've set up in advance and found people, but we, we've been meeting people and we'll be having a conversation with them. And I say, hey, this is a weird question, but would you mind if I grab my camera? And just talk to you for a few minutes because we we start talking to people and we tell them what we're doing and they're interested and they start telling us about them. And all of a sudden there's a story. These are ordinary people's stories that we're going to be telling this year. And I think all of them all have something extraordinary about them. As simple as they are. We talked to a guy who had started a small business in the middle of the pandemic. Imagine with everything else closing and, and, and how hard everything was to have the courage to do something like that. And it's just an ordinary story, but it was great. We've talked to a lot of people so far. So I think it's important for people to hear other people's stories because we can all learn from it. There's so much division in this country right now. And I don't think it's because we all have different beliefs. We do, but that's okay. I think that the problem is we're not listening to each other yeah. and we don't try to understand each other. Yeah. And so we have no political agenda on this trip this year. But I really do think that just by hearing ordinary people's stories that will understand each other better. And that helps, you know, people, people from one part of the country may not understand people from the other part of the country simply because they grew up differently, but that doesn't mean that they can't understand each other. And so I, th I hope that we can just help people listen to each other in really simple ways and really personal ways. It's funny you say that because I was uh, speaking somewhere in a different part of the country and it and I told them that I was born in California and I currently live in Portland and they were having a hard time believing I was even a Christian, you know, that, that there, there were Christians <laughs> out in California. I know you're from California, you know, that's where I grew up too. And so they're just like, holy cow, there are Christians in California you know, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, in, in Portland. So, I mean, they said it kind of facetiously, but if all you did was watch the news, you would think there's not a single Christian on the West coast, right? Like we can start to make some assumptions about people. <laughs> I think we're going to get to certain parts of the country this year, we're just pulling up in a car that has California plates on it. There's going to be a preconceived notion there from For someone sure. else. And I've seen it already. But then, you know what? Then that's that's our responsibility to help break that down. If somebody thinks, oh, you're from this part of the country. You don't think like me. Well, let's talk. You know, yeah. Let me tell your story. Let me tell you mine. I mean, again, it's really simple. And I hope that that helps people understand each other a little bit. Well, here's what I would say to the dad listening right now. When you hear somebody's story, you are getting a, a glimpse of God's character that you may have been missing out on. Another way of saying that is if you don't hear somebody's story, there may be a part of God 
that you don't know because you're only viewing God through the lens of your own life. And to assume that you have a full holistic understanding of who God is based on your own life is selling God short of who he is. When I hear somebody's story, and it can literally be anyone's, anybody's story. I don't care if they are the richest person in the world or the poorest person in the world, whatever their background is, you know, in all kinds of any background. When I get to hear somebody's story, I have to keep in mind, this is an image bearer of God. God has put himself in them. He has created them in his image. And so when they share their story, I get to see God from a different angle. And so if you're not doing that, you're actually missing out on getting a more clearer and fuller picture of who God is and your kids are. And so there's something beautiful about sitting. I love to sit at a dinner table and where there's food and I have my family around and we get to hear somebody else's story and we get to let our kids hear, oh man, this is how God is working in their life. Even if they don't claim to be a Christian, God is, I trust that God is at work. And so we get to hear how God is working throughout the world in all kinds of different people's story. And I just don't want to miss that. I don't want my kids to miss that. And so my challenge, I keep giving challenges here to listener, but man, try to have one person in your house or at least try to set it up to have dinner in your home with somebody in the next week and just have dinner with them and just hear their story. No agenda. Just like, Hey man, what's your story? Or Hey neighbor, what's your story? Anyway, I'll, I've been rambling, but I, I know you want to have some thoughts on that. No, what a cool idea. I don't know. People can't see us if they're listening, but I'm sitting here like nodding my head and thinking, <laughs> whoa, what a great, I mean, we're sort of living that for a year, but what a simple way to just do that at home or at school or, you know, just out and about in your community. That's great. That's way better advice than telling people to move into their car. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should have started there. Could have saved you. <laughs> Ask if you're yeah, I'd, still, I'd still have a job right now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just ask yourself, if you're listening, just ask yourself, do you know your neighbor's story? Do you know all your neighbor's story? I've lived here a year now, and I know kind of the surface level of my neighbor's story, but I don't know really their story. And so I'm convicted even in myself, like, what would it look like for me to have my neighbor over? Dude, I get so convicted when I do these shows. That's why I love this. But one of my neighbors, elderly woman, she brings me vegetables from her garden every week. The easiest thing for me to do would just be to make a meal with the vegetables that she's brought over. I made a meal with the stuff you brought over. Come enjoy it with me. And then just listen. Like, yeah, I'm convicted by that. Darn it. This is why I shouldn't do these anymore. Then it would be easier to not live in the conviction. But (laughs) well, now by saying it out loud, we can all hold you accountable. Yeah, exactly. Next week or next month, you got to tell us how that dinner went. Okay. I'm going to do it, man. I really am going to do it. I'm going to write it down right now and I'm going to make it on my list to invite her over for dinner. Man, this was so good, dude. Thank you for coming on and sharing just a piece of your story. I'm excited to follow along with your journey. Any last words, uh, or thoughts, or advice for the tired dad listening who maybe feels stuck in a job and just kind of in the rat race? He's doing the same thing every day, but yeah. his, his, his soul is stirring for more, but he doesn't know where to go from here. Well, I mean, the first thing I would say is that what we feel called to do isn't, isn't necessarily for everyone. Right. You know, you, there's no need for you to quit your job and move into your car to feel like you are following through on whatever it is you feel like you're called to do or to improve your situation. I would say, listen to what you think is nudging you. You know, for me, I was tired and I felt like I wasn't the same dad and husband that I had been a little bit earlier on in life. And that was a nudge. I think me feeling tired was God saying, okay, it's probably time to move on. And I'm going to make that a little bit easier for you by helping you want to move on. Hmm. And so again, I don't think anyone needs to take drastic steps in their life like we did. It's just l- look for those nudges and then and ask yourself, what's God trying to tell me and what can I do about it? Yeah. What's God trying to tell me and what am I going to do about it? That's a good word, man. We'll end there. Greg, thank you so much for hanging out with us today and sharing your story. We'll look forward to following along and safe travels to you as you go around the country, man. Jared, thank you so much. It's been an honor. All right. Thank you. All right. See ya. Thank you.